why can't a transistor be more like a tube? Well, we've got here also is news of RRI's annual contest for listeners. It's about Yashi, the historical capital of Romania. We are finished with uh, the tube type preamp and we're ready to go on to solid state. So as we go to solid state, um, I want to introduce another construction technique. Um, as you can see, I've got a piece of circuit board in the middle of everything now instead of a, a piece of just a piece of metal. The circuit board is uh, either FR4 or G10 or in this case, the very inexpensive composite single-sided board. And this is going to be what we're going to build on for the solid state amplifier. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, cordwood construction and uh, ugly construction techniques uh, with this video. So we'll be building um, our solid state circuits using circuit card material. So I have essentially duplicated the input coil system with the Faraday shield. Uh, I'm using a number 14 wire, regular house wire you can see. I've stripped one of them part, part way back because I know that with the solid state circuits I may need to tap the coil on the low end to get a good impedance match. Uh, when transistors first came out, of course, people wanted to immediately put them in the place of the tubes. And uh, what they found was that the transistors, especially the early transistors, were not quite up to the job. Uh, they were getting uh, problems with uh, overload, uh, cross-modulation, and intermodulation. Basically, when two stations uh, uh, mix together, and uh, you don't want that to happen, and all kinds of uh, spurs and what we call birdies pop up. And uh, the receiver front end is weak. It is not able to handle strong signals. So the early bipolar transistors uh, fell out of favor uh, rather quickly. And uh, I can show you some of, uh, some of the things that you'll see in some of the, uh, the books. Here's an early uh, preamp attempt where they've simp simply decided to use a common base style uh, preamp. Now the common base is a stronger type of preamp for, for uh, the front end of a receiver, but the problem is it doesn't have much gain. And look at all these tuned circuits. Uh, this looks like uh, very complex and uh, going to produce only about 5 or 6 dB of gain. Is it really worth it to build something like this? Uh, it wasn't long before people started to say, why isn't a transistor more like a tube? You know, from My Fair Lady. Uh, why isn't a transistor more like a tube? And the answer came in the advent of the MOSFET transistor. The MOSFET showed up in the, uh, the late 60s and early 70s and quickly replaced the transistor for the first stage of the preamp. The single gate or IGFET, isolated gate field effect transistor, IGFET, insulated gate field effect transistor, uh, became the front end of choice in the 70s. Very quickly uh, the dual gate MOSFET came in and we started to also use JFETs at that time. So FETs took over as the first stage of many of these amplifiers. So we're going to go through some of that. This is a completely blank slate. We haven't committed anything to the board yet. So let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about ugly construction. What is ugly construction? Uh, this is a uh, technique that's become pretty widespread in the uh, prototyping world. It's a successful uh, type of uh, electronic construction that gives you a good ground plane, allows rapid prototyping, and uh, you're able to uh, to get circuits done uh, very, very quickly. Construction has really gone mainstream in the prototyping world, and uh, it's starting out with uh, little Manhattan-style pads that are home-built, like Steve's here, 
and then uh, people uh, started manufacturing and selling them on websites. Surfboards came in because a lot of the surface mount parts were simply too small to deal with. So you solder them onto these surfboards, and then you can uh, easily access the chips. Um, uh, people came up with tools to be able to cut islands in the uh, substrate. Uh, this was done by razor knives originally, but now there are tools that can cut the little islands for you. I've attempted to uh, find the ugliest pieces of uh, FR4 circuit board, single-sided circuit board I can lay my hands on in the shop. I've got a couple pieces here. There's a couple of uh, very nice holes that have been drilled in one. And there's a chunk that we can use as our uh, connection points. So the first thing you do is you want to make sure that the, uh, the copper layer is nice and clean. So we've cleaned it up a little bit. I actually used a little, little bit of that scouring pad, that green uh, scouring pad stuff in the sink uh, with a little bit of detergent. You could just as well use some Ajax or some uh, scouring pads or uh, Brillo or fine wet sandpaper, whatever. This technique has been made popular by a lot of experienced builders. Harry Lithall, of course, has, uh, has made this a popular uh, building technique. So I use it sometimes when I'm doing some quick, rapid prototyping. But I wanted to show you the basic technique. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut a strip. And this, uh, this strip is going to represent our... B plus bus. So this is going to be our power bus for the circuit. I'm just going to put it right up here. Now that is insulated from the bottom ground plane. And we're going to use that to tie everything that goes to VCC. And that's going to give us a very convenient positive voltage point on the circuit. Now one thing that Harry does is he puts a electrolytic capacitor on one end of it and a, uh, a bypass capacitor on the other end. And that gives him a completely bypassed uh, RF uh, and DC and uh, low frequency. It gives him a very wide band, low impedance point to get power off. So it's a power bus. It's in effect the power bus uh, for the circuit. And we're just going to use a little bit of super glue to put that down. Okay, so we've uh, super glued our bus bar. This is also a good time to test and see if we have a short circuit. It's open. Okay, I've actually soldered three capacitors onto our bus. To the very left is a 100 microfarad electrolytic. Uh, that could be really anything from 10 to 100 microfarads. That's where we're going to attach our power source, our 9-volt uh, our battery, in the case of this circuit. Uh, the second capacitor is a 005 microfarad. And the third capacitor to the far right is a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So this is providing a, uh, a bypassed power bus pretty much to all frequencies that we're going to run into. And let me just add that the bus itself, as you can see, it's about two inches long and about uh, one-third of an inch wide. It represents a capacitor. You're producing a capacitor just by the physics of the two conductors. Yeah, include three little pieces of FR4 that will represent the uh, transistor pads. This is going to be a simple one transistor common emitter amplifier. So let's take a look at the uh, the bias point that we've got with uh, these particular resistors in this transistor. Uh, let's see what our bus is. Okay, it's 8.9, call it 9 volts. And on the collector, 5.3. So if the transistor had a little more gain, 
um, that would go down to 4.5. It would be exactly in the middle of the load line. It's pretty close to the middle of the load line right now, so I wouldn't okay, even touch here it. Here we are about 1.7 megahertz, where we know the amplifier is still uh, at high gain. We're going to start increasing our frequency. It's already starting to go down. So we make it to about 3 megahertz till we get to that 3 dB point. And uh, that's about what we're, we're expecting with this amplifier. In order to get more bandwidth, we're going to have to uh, do some tricks to overcome the Miller effect. And that'll come later in the video. So I've simply tacked down a 2N2222 emitter follower. Uh, it's got a 1K load resistor in the emitter of the emitter follower. And of course you would imagine that the voltage would come down off our 4 volts. Uh, we had uh, yeah 4.4 volts and the emitter down to 3.8 volts. So you might want to rebias that to bring it up a little touch. but. Uh, what I'm seeing is the addition of the emitter follower uh, definitely uh, extends the, the frequency so that that 3 dB point is way out around 7 megahertz now. So where we were only 2 or 3 megahertz with the emitter, common emitter amplifier with a fairly light load, uh, now with the emitter follower we have a pretty strong load, 150 ohm resistor I put on the output to represent our crystal radio and it's extended the frequency range some. So just a simple emitter follower example here. But this would be an excellent broadcast band amplifier. Uh, built ugly style, it would be much more stable than on our board. So of course the first candidate is uh, you know, our, our 2N2222 or 3904 style NPN switching transistors, which also are a very good general purpose transistors. The MPF-102 and all of the JFETs, uh, we get into the, uh, the depletion uh, single-gate MOSFETs and the uh, depletion dual-gate MOSFETs, which were very popular in the 70s. Uh, then uh, the current style that's popular is uh, the enhancement mode MOSFET. These are made for high-speed switching. Unfortunately, they have a really high front-to-back uh, drain to, uh, to gate capacitance. So uh, they aren't really useful for low noise front end work. And then we have the RF MOSFET, which is uh, coming to use with uh, uh, mostly with power amplifiers and driver amplifiers. Possible uses in the future for front ends. We've got a uh, breadboard prepared here. This is going to be the foundation kind of a playpen for the RF amplifier and uh, this being solid state there's many different technologies that uh, we want to check out so I'm uh, building a Faraday shield and I'll do the uh, similar tuning coil you know it's very rare to have a, a tuning setup that can cover such a wide band typically you'd have to use a band switch and three different uh, usually ferrite type tuned circuits, sometimes called loop sticks or uh, tuned uh, ferrite tuned uh, transformers to cover this wider range. It would be a three a three band affair to get from say three megahertz or two megahertz all the way up to 20 megahertz or 18 megahertz. But we are doing it with one sweep of the dial because we have a, a coil that has very low capacitance and we're preserving the uh, the Q of the coil by not loading it heavily with a lot of other capacitance and uh, we get the uh, the wide range uh, without having uh, separate tuned circuits. Of course the downside of that is it tunes very rapidly. If we had individual bands as you can see here uh, you'd have a very nice uh, peaking uh, ability in the particular broadcast band or amateur band that you're working in. So we have to be very careful when we're tuning with, uh, with something like so this. So let's think about what we're doing when we're making this Faraday shield. What is the Faraday shield really doing between the primary and the secondary of the RF transformer? You know, it just looks like a comb. How, how can that uh, 
help the circuit. And the, uh, the secret is that the little gaps between uh, all of these fingers do not stop the inductive component of the coupling. In other words, the, the two coils talk to each other in transformer fashion. However, because we're going to ground it to, this, to the ground plane, it's effectively working like a capacitor that is grounded. So when the, the primary coil and the secondary coil, that when they're very close to each other, they have a capacitive coupling action, when you put this thing in between the two of them, it's like grounding out the capacitors. So instead of coupling to each other, the two coils couple to ground, and therefore no stray signals are able to bridge the gap. So that's why it tends to reduce the pickup from the very strong broadcast stations, which normally would come sailing through due to the capacitive coupling. Of course, the other thing I'm trying to do with the shield is not get cut because <laughs> the metal is very sharp. Uh, the one that was used in the original crystal set, the shortwave crystal set, is aluminum. Um, the particular shield that I've just built here is a, uh, a tin-plated brass. And of course, these are in close proximity to the coil, so there's some effects and reaction to the coils, but it's, uh, it's very minimal. I don't think I would want to use a steel type uh, situation, but I'm sure it would work fine. Um, the problem is the steel tends to react more with the magnetic wave, which we are trying to couple. So we're trying to reduce the capacitive coupling and not affect the magnetic coupling. That's the secret between the uh, that's the secret of the Faraday shield. If we were to enclose the coils uh, in a solid shield, uh, we would have no coupling. We wouldn't have capacitive or magnetic coupling. But uh, we're trying to promote the magnetic and discourage the capacitive. So I've cut out some very small pieces of circuit card. And these little islands are going to be what we're going to put on the ground plane to produce our circuit. The components will uh, attach to these and they'll be insulated from the ground plane. This promotes uh, good high frequency uh, construction, much like a, a circuit board that's built over a, a ground plane and printed does. Now the only place where we have to be a little careful with something like this is at the high impedance points like at the input from the top of the tank, um, we would be introducing the capacitance of this big plate on top of the ground plane that looks like a capacitor and of course that's going to be added right in with the capacitance of the tuning dial so that could possibly reduce our tuning range so we have to be careful of that. We also have to be a little careful around places where the circuit is sensitive to capacitance. Now it's actually going to help us when we're at a low impedance point or we're at a point where we're trying to bypass something. It's just going to add to the bypass capacity. The next question is what do we do with these things? Well we glue them down uh, preferably with a super glue type uh, type of glue that has some uh, viscosity to it or a filler that makes it a little bit gooey and then you let that sit for a while and uh, if you solder quickly the pads will stay put. It's good practice to mount all of the components except for the uh, MOSFET, uh, the gate uh, circuit uh, diode protection and uh, connection to the, to the grounded tuned circuit is already completed. So we're just going to solder in the MOSFET next and uh, we'll have all the leads shorted with a, a piece of uh, solder wrapped around the leads. Uh, We'll have some fine wire around the leads so we don't uh, create a problem with the soldering iron. It's very easy to blow these things up 
Um, they've got some protection, but uh, if you get over about 10 volts, uh, you can uh, break down the, uh, the gate. So you have no idea what you're up against with these vintage components. Uh, they can arrive in almost any condition. So in this case we're going to spray the leads with a little bit of contact cleaner and try to get some of that goo off. Yeah, it's coming off. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Get some of that off there. At least to the point where it will solder okay. Man, what the heck happened? Okay. Next we consult with our handy diagram to see where our gates are, our source and our drain. The first configuration we will tie G1 and G2 together and we will be using the 40673 with the gates tied together to simulate a 3N128 single gate MOSFET. Okay, the MOSFET is now installed and we will remove the short shorting wire. Okay, let's just review where we are. We have uh, our first amplifier circuit which is this classic um, single insulated gate MOSFET feeding an emitter follower. This is a, a very old uh, booster type circuit and uh, we are using a 40763 with both gates tied together to simulate uh, the single gate device. I've got some bias points down there. We've got uh, point 548 on the source. The drain's got 6.49. Looks like we've got a hot 9 volt battery at 9.6 volts and 5.82 on the emitter follower. So um, it's well biased. Now we're using an oscilloscope to measure the gain of the stage and I'm doing this at 7 megahertz because my scope is only a 15 meg scope. I don't trust it at higher frequencies. I'm using a couple of scope probes, a 150 ohm carbon resistor as our load, simulating our crystal set, and the generator of course is a 50 ohm generator. So um, let's look at the input level first. And we are on the 5 volt, I'm sorry, 5 millivolt per division scale. And we've got 5 millivolts peak to peak there. Um, this is the, this, the probes are actually in the 1x scale. These are low impedance points, so we don't have to have a 10x scope probe. So we're using all the gain we can in the scope. So we don't have to set the generator very high. 5 millivolts peak to peak. And on the output, okay, we're peaking this. We're not getting 200, but we're getting, let's say, 190 millivolts peak to peak. So if you uh, put 190 over 5, uh, log, log it and multiply by 20, you get it 31.5 dB of gain here at 7 megahertz. So this is our, uh, our baseline amplifier.
Okay, this is the 16 meter band. It's about 2.30 in the afternoon and the long wire is attached. Band's definitely changing. We're getting uh, stations fading in and out. Okay, so we're looking at the 25 meter band. So, it seems to be pretty stable, and it's providing quite a bit of gain. Try 31 meters, see if there's anything there. Yeah, and this is a time of day where the band is not stable. We'll wait a little, wait a little longer. I'd like to try some different devices in this topology. I'd like to try a straight field effect transistor like an MPF-102. And then I'd like to try the dual MOSFET cascode configuration. So our vintage 40763 is doing a great job. As you can see, both of the gates are tied together. And we want to remove that thing. So the next thing we want to do is put the protective wire around it before we unsolder it. Next, we are going to remove the MOSFET. We've got our protection wire wrapped around the leads. We're going to unsolder the MOSFET, and we're going to insert an MPF-102 field effect transistor. So this is a, a standard N-channel field effect transistor. We're going to put in place. We're not going to adjust anything. We're not going to change any values. So now uh, with the uh, MPF-102, again, we're consulting our, uh, our pinout. Isn't it interesting how the, uh, the MPF-102 and the uh, 3819, both very popular FETs, and the 2SK-301, the pinouts are completely different. Boy, how many people have been screwed up with that. Okay, we now have the MPF-102 in. And we're tuned for uh, 25 meters. It is working, so next we'll, we'll check the game. Okay, we do need to get the bias points to see if we're anywhere near where we should be. Let's get that uh, emitter. 1.193. Let's get the drain. And of course the emitter will be down from that. 2.12. Okay, so biasing is a little bit heavier on this. Um, we probably could increase R1 if you wanted to center it up a little more. Right now we have a 470 in there. Maybe go to a 1K, but uh, of course we're still on the load line, and uh, it should work fine. Check our game. We've got our 5 millivolts peak to peak, and we'll go to the output. And uh, as you can see, it's much lower. So I get about 62 millivolts, 5 millivolts in, 62 out. That comes out to a gain of just about 22 dB. So we've lost 10 dB. So I hope everybody realizes that uh, the JFET does not have as much gain as the MOSFET. So if we were to use a, a 3N128 MOSFET in place of the MPF-102, we would expect to get about 10 dB more gain with this circuit. So you can't get something for nothing. So next we're going to arrange the MOSFET 
uh, the dual gate MOSFET in the dual gate mode, which is really a cascode configuration. And we'll see how much gain we get from that. Okay, remember what we're doing here. We just made a grounded voltage divider. And that voltage divider that we made is for gate number two on the dual gate MOSFET, which is the grounded gate stage. So just like we had the grounded grid or the common grid stage, um, we're going to have a grounded gate stage on the dual gate MOSFET. So we need this voltage divider set for approximately uh, a third of, of the 9 volts. And again, once we have the leads soldered, we're going to remove our shorting wire and uh, we're off scale on the scope. This is the same scale that we had with the JFET. And now we are definitely amplifying. We're also into a nonlinear region, so this has so much gain that we would have to decrease our input voltage in order to uh, get an accurate reading. But you can all already see that uh, we have a lot more gain with the cascode configuration in the dual gate MOSFET. Wow, an impressive 36.9 or 37 dB of gain with the dual gate MOSFET and cascode. So there's no doubt that the, uh, that the dual gate MOSFET um, in cascode mode into an emitter follower is, uh, is the winner. We could even do more by replacing R2 with a choke and uh, possibly even wrangle more gain out of the circuit. But essentially we've, we've certainly done as well as our tube type circuit. And you'd think we'd want to stop here, but um, the 40673 dual gate MOSFET is an obsolete part. And I don't like designing with obsolete parts. So maybe we go back to bipolar now and see what we can do with our old friend the 3904 and the 2N2222 see what we can wrangle out of very simple transistors. We know that the MOSFET type circuits have been around since uh, the early 70s and uh, I really would like to transition away from that back to some parts that we can get uh, readily like the 2N2222 and the 3904 type NPN transistors. So I worked with the same breadboarding style and uh, got a, uh, a cascode circuit working with an emitter follower. You can see on this one it looks like a pair of 2222s and a uh, 3904. And I'm pretty happy with the biasing. And now we're going to transition that circuit onto our tuner and see if we can get uh, something that uh, is usable and provides uh, the same kind of performance that we were getting with the MOSFET circuits. Okay, we now have the uh, bipolar version, and I've taken the initial voltage readings. Not bad on the biasing. Uh, the 13K resistor up here probably could be dropped to a 12K, which is fine. That's an even more standard value. I like to use standard values if possible. Um, this 7.5K down here kind of scared me, so I changed that to a 6.8K. 
okay. And uh, so it's a 6.8, a 5.6, and a 13K in the voltage divider stack. The voltage divider stack is what sets up the bias uh, for the first stage and the second stage. You can actually put a voltage divider independently on the common base stage, and that gives you full control over both stages. Doing the uh, totem pole voltage divider with three resistors, a little trickier, but uh, saves a resistor. You have to make darn sure that the base of the common base stage is grounded. So actually I've got a 0.1 and a 10 mic microfarad going to ground. So one thing that uh, you might notice here is that I use a center tap coil to uh, feed the, the first stage. Uh, the common emitter stage has this uh, pretty stiff bias stack and that means the impedance is going to be fairly low. So with a 1 or 2K input impedance, we need to tap down the coil. I approximately went in the middle, and I am noticing that the tuning is a little bit broader than what we've been seeing. So I might want to go down a couple turns, which is closer to the ground side on the, uh, on the coil. But uh, it, it certainly is working. From 620 it went down to 550 millivolts, so that's uh, 41.8 dB for the 2N2222, and I'm sorry, 40.82 dB for the 2222, and 41.8 for the 2N918. So we got 1 dB of gain out of the VHF transistor compared to the 2N2222 at 7 megahertz. So that tells you that the 2222 has uh, plenty of gain bandwidth and uh, operating it down here at 7 megahertz, it, it's doing a good job. So now let's try the next stage, the common base stage, and we'll change that to a 2N918 VHF transistor as well. Okay, we now have the 2N918s in both positions, both the uh, common emitter amplifier and the common base amplifier. And the gain has again gone up just a touch. Um, 650 millivolts over 5, so that's 42.27 dB gain. So um, we've essentially gone from 41 dB of gain to 42.3 dB of gain. It's really, uh, for a dB and a half of improvement, um, I would stick with the 2N2222s. Uh, with this circuit, and uh, it just uh, just shows you that uh, the cascode amplifier overcomes uh, quite a bit of Miller capacitance. Now, one thing I did notice is with the 2N918s, I had to uh, retune by l increasing the capacitance, which tells you that there is less capacitance in these transistors compared to the 2222 on the base uh, to collector. Okay, we're on our final uh, amplifier topology, and this is the uh, FET cascode with the emitter follower. This uses a pair of MPF 102s, and uh, I want to mention that uh, with a 9 volt battery, you're really asking quite a bit because they have to split the voltage between the two of them, so the biasing's a little tricky, but. Um, you can always put two 9 volt batteries in series and of course uh, double the values and uh, rebias it and uh, you can get a lot more compliance out of an amplifier like this. And that goes for any of these cascodes. The bipolar especially would uh, benefit from uh, more voltage. I've seen them as high as 30 volts on a pair of transistors. So uh, we're getting uh, an output of around 165 millivolts with 5 volts in. Uh, I'm sorry, 165 millivolts with 5 millivolts in. And that comes out to a gain of around 31 or 32 dB. That's quite good for uh, 
a pair of FETs. Uh, not as good as the MOSFET and certainly not as good as the bipolar as far as gain goes, but let's see how this thing does for uh, signal overload, selectivity, and, uh, and how it works on you. Wow, this video was a little bit longer than I planned, but uh, all of the work on the bench took some time to, uh, to get on film. Um, I think that uh, we learned a lot about using uh, devices in these uh, RF amplifiers. If I had to pick one that had the best performance, it would be the dual gate MOSFET. But uh, a close second is this uh, dual FET. And uh, you might wonder why I didn't pick the bipolar amplifier as my favorite, even though it has the most gain. Uh, the bipolar amplifier, I had to tap down on the coil almost to two turns in order to achieve the type of selectivity you can get right out of the box with a high impedance FET or MOSFET. And uh, there was no doubt that the bipolar overloaded a little bit easier than the, uh, the FETs or the MOSFETs. So I'm going to go for the uh, standard MPF-102 FET cascode with the emitter follower as my favorite amp to use with the crystal set. Also remember, any of these amps can easily overload a crystal set on strong stations. So use that loose coupler feature to reduce the gain and increase selectivity.